Psalm 19, verse 7. Psalm 19, verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, more much than much fine gold, sweeter are also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we pray for all those that are real, all those that are suffering, all those that have whatever affliction may be, that your healing hand be upon them, that you restore them and make them whole. We pray for, for those that are hurting, for those that uh, are grieving, Lord, and you continue to be with them. And then we pray, Father God, for all of our family and friends, everybody we have come in contact with, uh, that we shine your light, that they may know you and have fellowship with you and your Son. And we give you praise and glory, Lord. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So this, this beautiful psalm of David, he starts off with... Number seven, verse seven, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So what, what is it that, that converts the soul, according to David in the psalm? says, the law of the Lord is that which is perfect, converting the soul. So if, if, if you have this equation that you, that you put together, and what is necessary for a conversion to happen, according to this equation, is what? The law of the Lord, right? It, it's, and, it's, and it says it's perfect. Perfect. I mean, it's entire. It's complete. It's fully mature. It's perfect. Converting the soul. And he goes on to talk about the law of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, and, and I like that, said the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You know, for those of us that are simple-minded. You know, I'm, I'm just an old... Tennessee, Illinois, Missouri boy, you know, I'm a pretty simple mind. <laughs> Doesn't take much, right? So I, I, I like that, and I think that scripture's talking about me, but he says that the law, the testimonies, the statutes of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, and you know, the fear of the Lord is clean. So all, all these things start with the law, which is essential for conversion, right? Now turn with me to Galatians, Galatians 3. 24. A very essential verse. It says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law was a schoolmaster. What do you need a schoolmaster for? What, how did you learn your ABCs? I mean, how, how many of us went to school, right? Why? You don't count? Homeschooled. But, but we went to school and we, we were taught. We were taught in how we mature, not just in age, but we mature in education and wisdom and application of that wisdom and in knowledge. And, that, and that's what the, a schoolmaster does. It's the same as a, as a teacher. A, a, a master is, is in several places called, it's, it's the same as a teacher. So the schoolmaster, what, what is the, the, the schoolmaster here is the law. The law is what helps you grow it's helping you mature. It helps you be perfect, as Psalm 19 said. And But it's essentially, as Psalm 19 said, is the law is essential for conversion. And Galatians 3.24 says, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Amen? It's, it's essential to bring us to Christ, and it's essential for conversion. The law. And how, how many of y'all grew up 
know it, you had to memorize the Ten Commandments. You had to know, know what they were about. How many of y'all remember them being in school? Yeah. I, I remember it was sixth grade when uh, we used to pray in, in, every morning. We, we said the Lord's Prayer, and we had a time of prayer. Well, the teacher would take prayer requests. It was Mr. Wheeler's class. And, and I remember that there was the Ten Commandments on the wall. And I remember when he came in and took those Ten Commandments down, and we, we still said the pledge. We would say we would pray first, and then we'd say the pledge. But uh, no more Ten Commandments and no more prayer. It was sixth grade for me. And all of a sudden, you know, different people, different, different ages, and different school systems, it was all different, right? But for me, that was sixth grade, and it, and it sticks out like a sore thumb in history. Just, just appalled. Why would they do that? Why would he not be allowed to pray every morning? Why, 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 why? It didn't make sense to me. But uh, I wanted to look at James Madison, the fourth president known as the father of our Constitution, said, made the following statement. We have staked the whole of all our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. The father of our Constitution says all of our governance and everything is hinged upon the Ten Commandments of God. Not, not anything else outside of that, but it comes down to this, this is it. And that's what he believed. Strong Christian man the, and the father of our Constitution. Pull up that first picture, Bubba. This is the Supreme Court building. At the top of the Supreme Court building, what do we see? In the center, it's Moses and the tablets, the Ten Commandments. So this, this is the front of the, the Supreme Court building, right? And go to the next slide, Bub. This is on the doors, the entranceway into the Supreme Court building, denoting what? The Ten Commandments, right? Into the Supreme Court building. Huh. How, about, how cool is that? And uh, go to the next one, Bub. This, this is a, a pictorial. Who is that? It'd, it'd be Moses holding the commandments. This is this sits on the wall behind the 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 Chief Justice inside the Supreme Court building, where the Supreme where the Chief Justice sits. If you zoom in, boop, this is what you would find: the Ten Commandments. Well, why is that there? Because when this nation was formed, when the when the hinge of our Constitution, Bill of Rights, the the Supreme Court, how it was going to govern, it was governed, it was based upon God's Ten Commandments, just as James Madison just said. It was based on the Ten Commandments. Now, now if we look throughout history, though, we, we see a, a different a different outset. Does our country, do they make their laws hinged based upon God's laws now? No. In 1980, 1980, it's been a minute, right? I mean, what's that, uh, 42 years or so. The U.S. Supreme Court struck down the Kentucky statute that mandated the Ten Commandments be in every classroom. In 1980, Supreme Court says, can't do that. You can't have the Ten Commandments posted in every classroom. And they stripped it out. In uh, 2005, which is a lot, a lot later, and there's a lot more things that had to do with that in between those two, in 2005, the Supreme Court ordered the removal of the Ten Commandments in Kentucky courthouses. That was the first one. And they all, the rest of them fell like dominoes. As y'all probably seen it on the news over and over again, people battling to take the Ten Commandments out. And I think the, the one in Alabama is just about the only one left it still has the Ten Commandments inside the courthouse. And uh, I think the one in Alabama, that was about having it outside, not even inside. But that, that was way back in 2005, and you see the, the domino effect of what has happened, taking away the Ten Commandments of God. Now, why would people want to do that? What, what's, what's wrong with saying, don't lie, don't, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't kill? What, what is wrong with that? was the first three that people have a problem with. Turn your Bibles to Exodus 20. 
And from the, while you're turning there, you know the first two scriptures that we talked about, Galatians 3 says, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So if you take the law out of the equation, is they're bringing to Christ. In, in Psalm 19, 7, it says the, the law is essential for conversion. So if you take the law out, what do you have left? You're missing things out of the equation. And not to say that, it, it, that this is the mold. And unless you do this, this, and this, then you, know, you can't be saved. And you can't come to Christ. But, but when the Bible says this is essential, it means it's essential. Amen? And the Bible says that's essential. So, so let's, let's take a walk through real quick. In, through Exodus 20. Now, to, to lead up to this, in Exodus 19, God says to Moses, said, said hey, I'm going to speak to the people directly. I'm not going to use you as an in-between. I'm going to speak to the people directly. I'm going to give them an opportunity for them to purify themselves, to sanctify themselves. So you, you go back and you tell them to get ready because I'm going to talk to them. And I'm, at a certain time, I'm going to have them come up to the mountain, not on the mountain. I'm going to have them come up to the mountain and I'm going to speak to them directly. So, so they go back and it says, then the people sanctified themselves and they, and they prepared themselves for this great moment. And in, uh, I'll just read it in, in back in Exodus 19, 14, it said there was, a, there was thunderings and there was lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mouth and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Yeah, I, 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 I can just imagine seeing the mountain on fire, which you can, you can go to the mountain now. And, well, at a certain level, it's all black. It's the only mountain like that. It, it's just black. Why is it? It's the mountain of God. It says it was on fire, and it was burnt. So, so they come to this mountain that's on fire, and there's lightning, and there's thunders, and a, click, and a thick cloud, and the voice of the trumpet. And if you look at those, those significant things all throughout Scripture, mirrors the presence of the Lord over and over again, all the way up to Revelation. So, so in that, it says the people trembled. Okay. They, they are frightened. They're scared, which they should be. So back to chapter 20, verse 1, and it says God spake all these words. Right? And this is not what was written in stone as of yet. But he, said, he spake all these words saying, verse 2, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Commandment one, thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Commandment two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness of anything that is heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Commandment three, or no, keep it on. Don't bow down to them thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the third and fourth generation of them that hate the king. So he says, so he's worshiping other God is equivalent to hate in God's eyes. Verse 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Jesus quoted that exactly five times. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And all the way back in Exodus says, He shows mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Third one, Thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. So the first three are how you deal with God. The rules, the commandments on how you deal with God. The fourth one says, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor do all thy work. Seven days is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the fourth commandment. Verse three, how you deal with God. Fourth one. He says in he the says, New Testament, the Sabbath was named for man, not man for the Sabbath. Fourth one is how you deal with yourself, right? Fifth one, 
Honor your father and mother, that the days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That's the only commandment with promise. If you want to live a long life, honor your father and mother. Amen, Wyatt? Sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Seventh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Eighth, thou shalt not steal. Ninth, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And that does not, does not just mean lying. That means just making a false rep representation in any way. And number 10, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And then, so there's the, the first 10 that God speaks in person to the people. And all the people saw the thunderings and lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood, stood afar off. And he's like, high-tailed it. And they said to Moses, speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. They said, this, this voice coming from the mountain, we can't handle it. It's going to, it's going to kill, kill us. In 20, Moses said unto the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near under the thick darkness where God was. And this starts a, a run there. So the people backed off and they backed off and they backed off some more and Moses drew near. And Moses drew near. And he says, this God is testing you to see if you will fear him and not sin. And we know what happened to the people. They uh, complained and murmured. And they disobeyed God. They made the golden calf and the golden image. They had a big orgy. And they disobeyed God and, and God set his wrath upon them. So, so in this, we got the Ten Commandments, what we call the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. And that, that, that conversation between God and Moses continues all the way up to chapter 24, verse 7. And all that is contained, it says, and then Moses wrote the book of the covenant. And then from uh, 2412 to 3118 is when God creates the tablets and with his finger writes. And we know in the story that he's up there with God. God writes the, the, the commandments on tablets. And then Moses, and he hears this ruckus down below. And it's when they're having the orgy and they're worshiping the golden calf. And Moses goes down, takes the commandments. And the first thing he does Moses breaks the commandments. So he, Moses is the first one to break all the commandments. He throws them down. And then, and then they go the, the correction. The Levites go through and they, they slaughter a bunch of the disobedient. And then Moses goes back up in chapter 34 through chapter 40, six chapters or seven there, is when Moses gets the second set of tablets. But he tells Moses, says, you make the... You make the tablets, and you and you write them. So it's a little different than the first one and the second one. So that is a pretty neat fact. A lot of people go to the the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. So well, that's the Ten Commandments. Well, really, if you go all the way to chapter 40, you'll see the Ten Commandments, and they they differ slightly. So so in that, see, well, this, this is the Ten Commandments. This is God's commandments. What He says is necessary for conversion. This is what God says is the schoolmaster which leads us to Christ himself. And it's the law. Why does the law do that? What is so special about the law? Because it makes sinners of us all. This is Romans 3.19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every, every, you see that every, it means all, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the laws, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for the, by the law is the knowledge of sin. How do we know sin? It's by the, by the law. The law says this is sin, and this is how we know sin. So if we know sin, we know what is sin, then we know we have Sin, and in knowing we have sin, then as sin separates you from a very holy God, what do we need to be reconciled to God? 
And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is who we need to, to reconcile ourselves back to Christ. So in Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, 28 says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. He who despised Moses' law. What do, you, what do you think they're doing when they take the Ten Commandments out of schools? They despise the law. They, what do you think when they take it out of monuments and they take it off the off of school grounds and courthouse grounds? They despise the law. They're despising it. They hate it. They don't, the, you know, do you think Satan likes the thing that is essential to show people that they're sinners in need of a holy God? In need of Christ Jesus? Do you think Satan likes that? No, he hates it. That's why he uses unbelievers as tools to want to get rid of the freedom of speech, freedom of expression, but to get rid of that thing, the Ten Commandments, the law of God that points people to Jesus. So he says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. I sure would not want to be one of those people that died without mercy, would you? Verse 29, Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will re recompense saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. In verse 31, which is an amazing memory verse, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. As one of his Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the stepping off point. It's the, it's the foundation on which we stand is the fear of the Lord. Had, had we, would we have ever truly came to Christ had we not known how dreadful and despicable our sinful selves were. You know, without the sin, there's no, without the law, there's no knowledge of sin. So just as the fear of the Lord is the stepping stone unto, unto God and a necessity of salvation, so also is the law of God. Romans 3, verse 27. Now here, here it goes a little different because we've got to be we got to be careful because we can't be like the, the Pharisees we see in Scripture that they make their boast about being law keepers, right? We can't be that and say, well, here's my checklist. Well, I've, I've not done this, I've not done this, I've not done this, and I'm good to go, right? And you take Christ out of the equation. So verse 27 of Romans 3 says, where, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, by the law of faith. The law of faith. The law of faith is, is you take the law and Jesus went, but he takes it up a notch. He takes it to the next level. He takes it away from just the carnal keeping of the law to the mindset. And we've looked at some of these before, but if you turn back with me to Matthew 5, Matthew 5, which I thought it was interesting while I was over there donating the other day, I was going through the, the Sermon on the Mount. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, going through both of them. And you know you can find the Ten Commandments in the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus must have thought they were pretty important. You know, you can find the, the Ten Commandments in all of Paul's teaching, you can find it in James, you can find it in Revelation. So is, is it still important to us? Absolutely it's important. So Matthew 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Did Jesus obey all of the commandments of God? Absolutely, completely, without a shadow of a doubt. So verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass not one jot or one tittle, which is, the we would say, a, a comma or a period, even a, a fraction of any, the smallest bit of a, of a sentence or a word, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Is Jesus returned? 
for his children yet to stand as conquering king on the earth, destroying the wicked? Nope. Is all fulfilled? Nope. You see the fulfillment of that? Revelation 21, 22. And verse 19 says, Whosoever shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, which is what we call the hypocrite, so if you're breaking them, why would you teach people not to break them? He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and shall teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, which is hypocritical, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then, and then he continues on in verse 21, more about the commandments of God. And here, here's where we call it the law of faith. And James calls it the law of liberty. But he said, you've heard it said of them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. And then, so this is the law, this is Moses' law, and Jesus takes it up a notch. Verse 22, he says, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause... And you've got to make sure it's said without a cause in there. Because did Jesus get angry? It says he got angry when they were selling in the temple. And he said, and they sit, and he braided a whip before he went in and flipped the tables over and cleansed the temple of those who bought and sold. And he says, my father's house shall be a house of prayer. So Jesus got angry. Did he have a rightful cause? Absolutely. Absolutely. In verse 22, I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, as in your worthless, shall be in danger of the council. Whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So Jesus takes it from not just don't just kill, but don't be angry with someone without a cause. Without placing a righteous judgment to be angry. We shouldn't be angry with anybody. In Hebrews it says, have peace with all men, without which no man can see the Lord. And, and if you look down at verse 27, he goes through another law. And he says, you have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Right? That's Moses' law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And Jesus says, verse 28, I say unto you that whosoever looked on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So to, Jesus takes it from the act to the thought, to the intent of the heart, to the want and the desire. And if you continue on, he goes on an eye for an eye. So Jesus thought it was important, and important in the, the, the most, in most important sermon in the Bible. The Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plains, they're the same, just two different areas. One is to the disciples, the other one is to a, a multitude. Is, it, is the law important? Yes. But with Christ, he takes it up a notch. So that, so what's the purpose of taking up, it up a notch? So we're not like the Pharisees and thinking, well, I've kept this commandment and I've kept this commandment, and we'll make our boast, which we should not do. In Luke 10, verse 25. So here we have a man trying to justify himself. And he says, verse 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, so he's trying to trip up Jesus. What a foolish thing to do, right? says, Master, which is the same as teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. You know, there's only a handful of people that actually say that in Scripture. Philippian jailer is probably my favorite out of that. Well, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In verse 26, he said unto them, What is written in the law? How readest thou? A lawyer who should know the law greater than a lawyer, right? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy strength, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor is thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? So he's trying to, trying to weasel out of this, the commandments. He knows the commandments, but he's saying, uh, Who's my command? Who's my neighbor? 
And Jesus talks about the, the great Samaritan there. and said, everybody's your neighbor. You don't get to pick and choose who your neighbor is, even though, it's, even though it may be a filthy Samaritan. It's still your neighbor. Amen? In Romans 13, verse 8, and a lot of uh, American Christianity, I, I put it out there, American churchianity, some people like to call it, there, there is a, a movement that it was, de, it was declared a heresy I think 310 A.D. Way back when it was declared a heresy. And then it was called antinomianism, which is when you come to Christ and there's no law for you to obey anymore, there's no rules to go by anymore, you can do what you want. Everything you do is covered by grace. God doesn't see your sins. So you just go and do whatever you want. It's, it's called antinomianism. And people who abide that are called antinomians. And there's a, the, we, we call it the uh, the greasy grace movement. That you can just do whatever you want. God doesn't care. You can live like you want, talk like you want, be how you want. And just as long as you've repeated a prayer sometime or other, and you're good to go. But is that what the Word of God says? Absolutely not. God, God is specific that he, he does make rules by which we live by. But, but the great thing about it is when we are come to Christ and we're born again and we, we believe in Him and we trust in Him and we're filled with the Spirit of God, not only do we want to do what pleases God, but it comes by nature to please God. It, it should come by nature if you love God to love people. It should come by nature to do those things which pleases your Father in Heaven. So in, in this scripture it says in thir Romans 13 verse 8, Oh, no man anything. Well, that's a pretty hard one to do right there, isn't it? Owe no man anything but to love one another. That's what you owe every man. Love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. What's that mean? He that loves one another hath fulfilled the law. If you love your neighbor as yourself, are you going to cheat on their wife? If you love your neighbor as yourself, are you going to steal from them? Are you going to lie to them? Are you going to bear false witness against them? Are you going to do all the things? Are you going to covet their stuff? No. No. Because it's the love of God that should be in us that keeps us from doing those things. So he that loves one another had fulfilled the law. So that, that takes it up a notch. So I'm, I'm just not, I'm just not just going to, going to not covet my neighbor's things. I'm going to love him. Right? It's one thing just to not covet his stuff. It's one thing just to not to lie to him. But it's a whole other thing to love him and love your neighbor as yourself. So he that, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law, verse 9, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. Does this list sound familiar? Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Paul's going through the laws, is he not? Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All these things. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to do these things against your neighbor. And verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So if we don't have love, are we going to fulfill the law? If we don't have, number one, the love of God, are we going to fulfill the law? No. If you turn with me to, uh, to back to Matthew 22, verse 35. When the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, as in he answered their question and he shut them up quick, right? In the verse 35, from your story, they then asked one of them, which was a lawyer. Here's another lawyer. Could have been the same lawyer, as we saw in Luke. But he asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, well, well, you're saying a good thing. Is he a good teacher? Well, the Muslims call him a good teacher. But he's a lot more than a good teacher, right? Master, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus answered unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If we, if we are busy about the business of loving God and loving people, then the commandments that were chiseled in stone have little effect on us because we are far exceeding those great commandments that God gave Moses thousands of years ago. If, we, if we're loving God and loving people, those, those commandments are, are a good stepping off point, as in it's a good point, you know, point to salvation. That's a good stepping off point. It's a good step towards salvation. It's a good step towards conversion and towards Jesus Christ. But those who love God and love people, those commandments are the base necessity, the basest of commands. And we shouldn't have any problem keeping those commands. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 3. And we get down to the, the, the heart and soul of the matter. Why? Why did God give us these commandments? Well, he wanted a holy people. In Exodus 19, right before Exodus 20, where he gives the 10, Exodus 19, he says, so that you may be a kingdom of priests. He says, not just to have a Levitical priesthood and those that mind the, the tabernacle, but that you should be a kingdom of priests, as in everyone in my kingdom should toe the line like the Levitical, like the priest do. So 2 Corinthians 3, look at verse 3. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. And read that again. For as much as ye, that would be us, He's talking to the Corinthian church. It's also speaking to us. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the, the epistle of Christ. You are the written letters, the living letters of Christ. You who are Christ, who should have the law of God not only written on tablets of stone, but written on our hearts. We are the epistles of Christ. We are the living word. You, you heard the, the, uh, the saying that says, you may be the only Bible anybody ever reads. And it's true. And that's, that's where we get that saying is from this scripture that says, you are the epistle of Christ. You are the living, Christ living in you, the word of God living in you. You're walking, talking, and you're taking him with you. And you are his epistle. And what you say, what you do, and how you act, and how you walk, how you observe yourself should reflect as much that you are the epistle of Christ. Ministered by us. He says, you, we, were, we were your servants. Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. For such trust we have through Christ to Godward. So we, we trust God that God will finish the God will finish what He started. God will complete what He set forth to do. God will take you, who was a dirty, filthy, rotten sinner, see the error of your ways through the law of God, fear God enough to turn to Jesus, the only salvation that we can have, the only escape from God's wrath and God's punishment that we can have is through His Son, Jesus Christ. We not only get that escape from from God's wrath through Christ, but we also go the next step in our love for God and for one another. And, and in so doing, we become the walking epistles of Christ. God, God, doesn't, God didn't die so we could just be the same. God didn't shed his blood on the cross, get nailed in his feet and his hands and, and the piercing of the thorns on his head and the piercing on his side. He didn't take all of that just so we could uh, just live our life, just go through life willy-nilly. Well, I know he did that, and uh, whatever. You know, what I want and what I need is more important than anything else, and I'm just going to do what I want and what I need. Well, God saved us. God died for us so that we, be, we can become something more, so that we, be, we can be the reflection of him walking on the earth, living for him, walking for him, acting for him, telling others about him. 
so that they may have the same fellowship and the same joy that we have and walk in such a way that the people are mystified. Says, I don't know why you act like that. So well, let me tell you why I act like that. I serve a holy God who died for me and changed me. That's why I act like that. So, so in saying all that, and it comes back to the law of God. Is it essential? Is it important? Should we desire to know it? When the Jews said you write it and you put it on a thing and you write it on your doorposts so you don't forget it. But now our society has moved as far to take it away. So we don't remember it as much. So that we don't look upon it. So that we're not convicted by it. But we should be convicted by it. It is essential. And thank God we have the freedoms that we, if we wanted to put the Ten Commandments on the front of our house, we could do it. Amen. If we wanted to put it on the, put it on Facebook, we could do it. If we wanted to plaster it on a shirt on a billboard, we could do it. Uh, a friend, uh, John Peters, it, it, he does that. He goes all around the, port, the country and he, he's got all these banners and he puts billboards up and banners everywhere all across the country so people see and they know and they may come to Christ. So we can be the living commandments. We can be that which God desires us to be. Amen. Draw one step closer to him. Please like and share and follow us, subscribe and all that other stuff that we're supposed to say at the end of the videos. So until we see you again, God bless and God ventures. Bye.